All right. Well, cheers to many things. Cheers to Bourdain Day. To Bourdain Day. Cheers to us finally doing this, which I don't know. Felt like we've been together four years, and we always talk about doing something like a podcast, and we always are just like, eh. So yeah, we, we're Who hasn't very talked about doing a podcast. Probably. No, for sure, for sure. <laughs> But it was just one of those moments where I was like, all right, Gary Vee is always yelling at me. He's like, you got a phone? No excuses. And I was like, man, this guy's right. So I bought a GoPro uh, 7. Shouts to GoPro Hero 7. Yeah. T-shirts. Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> so um, we have one. And we, we just came back from LA and got engaged and all kinds of cool stuff. But today was the day. Mm. Diamond nose ring. Oh, yeah. Um, and again, because uh, I work in the service industry, you are, I don't know how it is in every state, but in my state, you're not allowed to wear an engagement ring while working, and I'm not really a jewelry person anyway. And so, uh, and my mom also asked my dad for engagement earrings instead of a ring for essentially the same reason, and I thought, no. between not actually enjoying wearing jewelry, rings, or really earrings too much, I figure why not ask for something that I wear all the time and I'm not going to lose. <laughs> Also, even our, we've been together four years now, over four years, but even our first few months, I mean, it, it, I mean, it comes up, you know, you talk to someone that you're, you're seeing and just future, like, oh, what do you, you know, whatever, what kind of wedding would you like? And I think you have told me, even since I first met you, that that was, you like, you wanted a nose ring, you wanted it to be on a trip, so I thought that was really cool. Um, and yeah, just, you know, the time was right, and we, I liked it, and I put a ring on it. Uh, fiance. Um, but yeah, so, uh, we, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's Bourdain Day, which is bittersweet, um, and the reason, we've, we've always been wanting to do, like I said, to do something, but, like, I was just sitting here, and I was like, I had a pretty, you know, one of those days at work where I was just like, fuck, you know, just really gutted, and just, like, for many reasons, just, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give you some backstory, like, I'm a chef, and, you know, she works in the front of the house, but, uh, I, I had, you know, one of those days where I was like, ugh, and then she had her day, and it was just like, ugh. We were just talking, and the next thing I know, she comes out of the bathroom, like, bawling, like, in tears. And I'm like, oh my god, baby, what's wrong? Like, who died? And ironically enough, she's like, I just read an article about Anthony Bourdain, and it's, like, so sad. And I was just, like, broken. I was like, okay, like, we're gonna sit and just talk. And, uh, and just, yeah. And the article was all about ways to celebrate Bourdain Day, and one of it is just, um, it was... Jose Andres and Eric Repair are the ones kind of leading this. And they said just they were the raise first a glass to declare on any officially. social media. Yeah, because we're yeah. remembering Anthony Bourdain by how he lived and who he was. We're not remembering him by how we lost him. Mm -hmm. um, and he would have wanted us to say cheers and take a sip and spend time and talk about Definitely. things that matter to us. And hopefully food is included in that. Um, and so... That was the other part of the reason, well. Yeah, and also even today, or actually last night, um, Kat Kinsman, shout out to Kat Kinsman, who's amazing. She's one of my favorite people in, um, in this business. I've never had the pleasure of meeting her. I know one day we, we certainly will. Just the way that we're going and our trajectory, you know, hopefully we'll cross paths. I mean, likely will, but definitely it's something that we, we would be, it would be an honor to, to meet her. But um, she had a great podcast on, catch it on Spotify and a bunch of other platforms, Food and Wine. Uh, podcast, but she had a kind of a round table with with some great um, chefs and, and restaurant people that, that talked a little bit about it and I, I heard it at work and it just like it was a bittersweet day. Like it was it was a tough day at work, it was like you know what happens, you know, you 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 know, you dust yourself off and then you go back and, and, and fight another day. But um it was this weird like celebration um of of Anthony Bourdain's life. But at the same time it's like this like sick reminder that one he's gone two that it's been a fucking year already yeah, and three that like where we were a year ago and where we are now like this is how quickly time flies like this is what my life i can tell you i can tell you right now last year when i heard that he that he died i was at like it was like two restaurant jobs ago i was a sous chef at a place on my way out my notice had already been put in one month notice um to go elsewhere, and now I'm not even at that place. I uh, I'm at a, a new place now, and like, you know, for some people who've never worked restaurants, like, oh wow, like three jobs in a year, like yeah, you know, it happens, you know. But for for a lot of the service industry people, like, if I actually explain to you the reasoning behind all all those moves in one calendar year, it would just make 
complete sense. But again, someone like Anthony Bourdain got that. And I say that a lot of people are like, oh, I love that guy. Like, I wish I had a job where I could just go around and travel and eat food and talk about it. Like, totally. We all agree. That's it's a great job to have. I'm sure it's most of our dream jobs. Um, I'm of the firm belief that one of the best things about Anthony Bourdain to me and most people that I know from restaurants that were really crushed by his death and still are, is that he knew exactly how we were feeling and he had been there or knew someone that had or avoided it or like just it was just a very like deep earnest understanding of how brutal this business is but also how rewarding and amazing this business can be and we get it like we always joke that we're like we're lifers and it's not really a joke it's just like oh no we're lifers like we could do many things you know down the road and do them well and still make a living but like we're the kind of people that like live for this business and like, absolutely and especially speaking personally as somebody who gets uh, different pressures from various different people in my life to do literally anything else. Uh, you completely had a, a, your own experience with that growing up with your, I think your parents wanted you to be anything but. I mean, my, my, pa Monica. yeah, my parents are like a academics, you know, my, my father does in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination. Um, my mother is a Spanish professor at UNC Chapel Hill. So they busted their hump to go to college and like make something of themselves and raise us to like a value education. And um, school just wasn't for me. And I don't think my parents loved the idea because I basically like chose to become a chef. Really, I chose, I got a job as a dishwasher because I wanted to be a chef and that was the way to do it. Um, and I ch basically chose that instead of doing a law career or going into some criminal justice position or like mm -hmm. some sort of like, I mean, I thought about politics. My dad always said I would be really good like in the nonprofit sector or in social work, which I don't disagree with him, but it's just like, it, it's a calling for me. Like to be a chef is a calling. And one of the first people that really made me proud uh, after the fact when I was already like making nine bucks an hour at my third job, but I was like a pig and shit, like I loved it. And I knew that if it worked hard enough that I could be a chef at a high level um, and that was my goal and I never never not like pursued it I was always just like so obsessed about like moving up moving up moving up and I would work the jobs for nine bucks an hour and I would work my ass off and I would try to do the best that I could to learn the next station the next menu to get creative control to cook family meal and you were even telling me that when you and I first met which was uh I guess about like six almost, years ago. Yeah, almost six years ago. It was in twenty thirteen. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So And I knew it. And and again my parents, you know, now they, they, they accept what I do, they see where I got from where I started. They send me recipes on Facebook. Like my mom and I talk food literally every day. And my mom is a hell of a cook. And my dad's got she some dishes in, my dad's got some dishes, you know, he, he doesn't cook a lot, but when he does, it's pretty good. But my father's mother, my grandma Lola, rest in peace, was an amazing cook. And then my mom's mom was a good cook, but she was a resourceful cook. She could make you anything with whatever she had in the pantry if you showed up at three in the morning. It might be a little smorgasbord and like a, a mashup of a few different things, but she could do it. And she had that seasoning. She knew how to add just enough salt. Oh, this needs a little bit of acidity, but it also needs some kick. Oh, jalapeno juice. Right, pickled jalapeno juice. Like that's a trick I learned from my grandma Cortez, which is my mom's mom. But and I was really lucky in that I came from two people who really liked food and really liked to cook. Uh, you know, my dad's parents obviously they grew up in the era where food was pretty bland everywhere. But because my grandpa was in the Navy, they traveled all around the world, and they both loved to travel. And so they were stationed in Spain. And so some of my dad's early, like when he was five, six, and seven years old. He was living in Spain and they had a live in, you know, cook who ran shit and she, you know, so my dad had this whole experience really falling in love with food and, a, and good food at an early age. And my grand or my mom grew up in Appalachia, but as soon as she turned 18 and got out and explored the world, she was always interested in like trying food and trying stuff. So sure. that's always something they bonded over. Definitely. And even my mom's brief stint working as a dishwasher and doing catering 
is how she and my dad ended up meeting. That's another story for another day. But it's so, a great story. Even though my parents are both not restaurant people, um, but they are both people who love to cook and love to entertain. They're gourmands is the way that I, I, I food it gets thrown around and like, yeah. I, I'm almost, I almost came full circle. It's like when you eat your way like to China almost or dig your way to China. Like I like hated the word foodie and then I hated it some more and then I really hated it and then I like, didn't want to hear it ever again. And then it made this resurgence where I understood it and then I was completely just like, okay with it. And I was like, yeah, it's a thing now. And then I had friends who I literally, I mean, you could tell me or bet me a hundred dollars, like a hundred dollars that I would never hear the word like, well, you know, I'm a foodie, right? Coming out of some of my friends' mouths. And I have friends who I legit didn't even know could cook, let alone like would know that I have like conversations with friends of mine where I'm like, that's amazing. And you make We're this like at home? Dinner parties that we definitely don't get invited to, but sure. like hear about after the fact. And it's like, oh shit, y'all are getting like, together. And you cooking? guys did like, a rack amazing. of what? Like who yeah. taught you how to make that? And it's it's awesome. But so then I was like, yeah, foodie, it's a doctor. So gourmand to me is like, uh, there's a book by Embriette Savaran that like it took me three years to get through because it's such a hard book, but it's called The Physiology of Taste. And if you ever read The Physiology of Taste and actually understand the book and the ramblings of what I consider to be a madman, uh, Embriette Savaran was a brilliant guy, but they actually make a really great triple cream bee, uh, brie, sorry, uh, cheese that's named uh, Savaran, Embriette Savaran. It's a great cheese. And uh, he was a really, really smart guy, but like, to me, when I read that book, I'm like, oh, I am so dumb. I have no idea what this person is talking about. That to me is the...